we're going to continue on with part E, which talks a little bit more about protections of the central nervous system. We just got done talk talking about the meninges that surround uh, the brain in case it. So we had, remember, the dura mater, the arachnoid mater, and the pia mater. Plus, within the arachnoid mater, we also had cerebral spinal fluid that flows around that also adds a layer of protection too. Okay, So now we have one more layer, and it's called the blood-brain barrier. Okay, um, It includes the least permeable capillaries of the body. Capillaries are usually very, very um, porous. They're very perme permeable to let things in and out of them. Okay, um, So these guys are not very permeable to everything that's found in them in terms of like red blood cells and white blood cells and so forth. They can let things out like water, glucose, amino acids to pass through capillary walls, but any other harmful substances um, it, it prevents those from happening. And one of the cells that helps monitor this are the astrocytes, okay? Astrocytes will cling to capillaries. They will also cling to um, neurons. And they are kind of the barrier between blood vessels and neurons. And they, um, you know, will only allow certain things to pass between the capillary and the neuron, okay? Um, so it is important that... Um, there's a regulation on what can kind of enter and leave the blood vessels in terms of being around a neuron. Okay, neurons are very delicate. You don't want harmful substances um, to come near them and harm them. Okay, because then that will disrupt brain function. Okay, so that's a, just that's kind of the the last way that the brain is protected is through what we call the blood-brain barrier. Okay, and a lot like I said, a lot of that's due to the astrocytes that are found there. Okay. Um, Okay, let's talk a little bit about some traumatic brain injuries. Um, I'm sure you probably all have heard about concussion, okay? Anytime you bump your head, you get a concussion. That, a concussion is just when you bump your head. Some concussions are worse than others in terms of how hard you bump your head, okay? It is what we call a slight brain injury, okay? Typically, little permanent brain damage occurs unless you've had a multiple of concussions, okay? Like, you know, if you're a football player that's constantly getting hit in the head, um, you know, I think now in high school sports, if you have more than three or four concussions, you are medically banned from playing sports anymore. Um, so, you know, one or two concussions, and also, I guess, depending on how hard you hit your head, um, usually is, is typically, per, you know, little permanent damage. It, it will, the brain will heal on its own. Um, now, what is bad is when you get a contusion, which is like when you hit your head on the dashboard or you hit your head on the windshield, okay? This is marked by nervous tissue destruction because you've hit your head so hard it's caused a, um, a bruise on the brain, okay? That's what a contusion is, right? It's a little bit of brain, ble brain bleeding, okay? Coma may occur here where you lose consciousness, okay? Death may occur after a head blow due to what we call intracranial hemorrhage, so this is bleeding in the brain, uh, or cerebral edema, this is swelling in the brain, okay? So either one of these can lead to uh, death of the brain if the pressure is not released, okay? So intracranial hemorrhage is bleeding within the brain, and then this is swelling within the brain, okay? Another dysfunction of the brain is what we call a cerebrovascular um, accident. It's a CVA. It's just the technical term for having a stroke. Um, a stroke is when um, the brain is without oxygen. Uh, it could be due to a clot. Most strokes are caused by some kind of clot. Um, and it results where blood circulation to the brain area is blocked and brain tissue ends up dying. And that's what a stroke is. And so whatever tissue ends up dying, that particular function of the brain is going to be hindered. Okay. Um, loss of some function or death may result. Um, hemiplegia is one-sided paralysis. So if you have a stroke on the left hemisphere, your right side might be um, paralyzed. If you have a stroke on the right side, your left side might be paralyzed, okay, depending on where um, the stroke occurs. Aphasia is damage to the speech center of the left hemisphere. Remember, this is, um, we had the Broca's area. Um, and if you have a stroke in the Broca's area, uh, you'll have, you're going to have a really hard time speaking, okay? You're not going to be able to form words um, because the Broca's area is what allows your um, muscles of your mouth, your tongue, your throat to be able to produce sound, okay? Um, and that's called aphasia. So, you, you know, loss of speech due to a uh, stroke in the left hemisphere, okay? A transient ischemic attack, a TIA, TIA is kind of like um, very similar to um, a stroke in that it, there's some kind of restriction of blood flow. Um, it can cause numbness, temporary paralysis, impaired speech. 
Um, so it, you know, there's might not necessarily be a, a complete blockage, but restriction. There's a kind of a constriction in, in um, blood vessels, and it can lead to what we call temporary uh, brain ischemia. Okay, and they have uh, drugs now that are called clot busters that can go in and help break up clots and so forth before um, a lot of brain damage occurs. But it has to be given very shortly after the attack, after the stroke or the um, TIA has happened. Okay. All right, let's get into the spinal cord now. So we talked all about the brain. So the second part of the central nervous system is our spinal cord, okay? So it extends from the foramen magnum of the skull to the first or second lumbar vertebrae. The spinal cord does not go all the way down our back. It actually ends um, at the first or second lumbar. So L1, L2 is where our spinal cord actually stops, okay? It provides a two-way conduction pathway to and from the brain, okay? It's protected also by the vertebrae, so bone and meninges. So there are meninges that surround the spinal cord, so dura mater, arachnoid mater, and pia mater. They also are found around the spinal cord, okay? The spinal cord gives rise to 31 pairs of spinal nerves. Um, at the very end of the spinal cord is something called the cauda equina. It is a collection of spinal nerves at the inferior end. And the a cauda equina means um, horse's tail, okay? Um, a, a cauda means tail, end, and then equine, equine means horse, okay? So it kind of looks like, and if you look at the picture, it looks like a horse's tail. Down here is the cauda equina, okay? Um, here's the very end of the uh, spinal cord. You can kind of see it right there, okay? Um, and then there's a ligament that kind of anchors the uh, the spinal cord in place. It keeps it kind of in the center of the vertebral column. I um, mean, this is kind of this blue structure right here. Okay, it's, it's a, just a tendon that uh, will anchor the end of the spinal cord. Okay, um, you'll see a couple enlargements which are really interesting. So if you look at the spinal cord, you'll see an enlargement right here, and then you see another enlargement right here. And the reason that you have these enlargements is because the nerves for the appendage, the upper appendages, come off of the cervical enlargement. So all of the nerves that govern the arms come off the cervical enlargement. In the lumbar enlargement, all of the nerves that um, go down to the legs come off of the lumbar enlargement. Okay, and there's lots of nerves that come off for the legs and the arms. And so the spinal cord in those areas is um, a little bit bigger. And you can kind of see that in this picture. It kind of is kind of making a bulge in this area in this area, and that's just because the nerves for the arms and legs come off of those areas, okay? All right, so going from the very top all the way down to probably what, L1, L2, all the 31 nerves, uh, spinal nerves, um, are attached to the spinal cord there, okay? And then here's, again, the cauda equina, okay? So the spinal cord, if we take a cross section of the spinal cord, okay, it has gray and white matter in it. So gray matter of the spinal cord and spinal roots, okay, so internal gray matter is mostly cell bodies, right? Posterior dorsal horns house interneurons, okay, receive information from sensory neurons in the dorsal root, cell bodies housed in the dorsal root ganglion, and we'll, I'll show you a picture of all of this, so let's just go through and fill in your notes. Ventral anterior horns house motor neurons of the somatic voluntary nervous system. They send motor information out the ventral root. Gray matter surrounds the central canal, which is filled with cerebrospinal fluid. Okay, so get all that down, and then I'll show you with a picture what all of this means. Okay. White matter of the spinal cord is composed of myelinated fiber tracts. So these fiber tracts are axons. Okay, um, three regions. You have a dorsal, lateral, and ventral columns. Uh, sensory afferent tracts conduct impulses towards the brain. Motor efferent tracts conduct impulses away from the brain. And if you look, here's a nice cross section of the spinal cord. You can see you've got this gray matter on the inside, and it's made up of three horns. You have a posterior horn, a lateral horn, and an anterior horn. Okay, This middle section right here is called the gray commissure. It connects this side to this side. And then you also see a little hole right there, and that's called the central canal where cerebral spinal fluid will flow through. Okay, here are the spinal roots. So this is coming off the front side. These are anterior spinal roots, posterior spinal roots. Okay, so you have those on both sides. This bulging right here is a, a dorsal root ganglion. And if you remember what a ganglion was, it is a cluster of cell bodies in the peripheral nervous system. That's what this ganglion is. Okay, um, so the back portion of this has sensory nerves. The front has motor nerves. Okay, so it goes through the back, sensory nerves, 
inner neuron, and then it comes out the motor neuron, which is the front portion, okay? Um, most spinal nerves have a mixture of motor and spinal um, nerves in it, okay? But once you hit this dorsal root ganglion, it's only sensory going here, and then coming out the front, it's only motor until they meet up after this ganglion, okay? All right, and you can kind of see, and you can kind of see here's the dura mater, here's the arachnoid mater, and then the pia mater is going to be actually attached to the surface of the spinal cord. Okay, this is all white matter here, and it's made up of different columns. You have the dorsal column here, on the sides you have the lateral column, and then you also have the ventral column, which is here in the front. Okay, these are blood vessels and, and uh, arteries. Okay, that provide nourishment to the spinal cord. But those are pretty much all the parts and pieces that um, you need to learn for the spinal cord. Okay. The peripheral nervous system consists of nerves and ganglia outside the central nervous system. So coming off of the brain and spinal cord um, are nerves that make up the peripheral nervous system. So anything that comes off the brain and spinal cord is part of the peripheral nervous system. Okay, And um, nerves are bundles of neuron fibers found outside of the central nervous system. And nerves are things like your sciatic nerve, your femoral nerve, your ulnar nerve, okay? Um, and they come off of the spinal cord. Um, they are covered. They, what's really interesting about nerves is they look just like muscle, okay? There are a tube within a tube within a tube. And remember we had like endomycium, paramycium, and epimycium? We have the same thing in nerves, but it's called endoneurium, perineurium, and epineurium, okay? There are also fossicles found in nerve tissue, and you'll be really surprised at what a nerve looks like because it looks almost like a, a muscle, okay? So here on the outside, here's your epineurium. Okay, this right here is a fossicle. It is surrounded by perineurium, and all of these inside here are just axons, okay, from, um, from nerve cells, okay? And each of one of these is surrounded by endoneurium, okay? And then you can kind of see here's the axon. Um, the cell body is going to be up in probably in the peripheral or in the uh, central nervous system, um, but you can see that it is myelinated, um, but it is covered by endoneurium. Okay, and then a whole group of axons uh, is surrounded by perineurium, so that's called a fossicle, just like in muscles. Okay, and then all of that is surrounded by epineurium. Okay, and all of this would make up a whole nerve. Okay. Now, some nerves contain both sensory and motor fibers, okay? There are some nerves that contain just sensory, and there's some that contain just motor, okay? Sensory always carries to the central nervous system. Motor always carries away from the central nervous system, okay? Now, when we talk about the peripheral nervous system, we talk about, if you can remember from the very beginning, I said that there were um, 12 cranial nerves that come off the brain that are part of the peripheral nervous system, and there are 31 spinal nerves that come off the spine that make up the peripheral nervous system. So let's talk about the cranial nerves first. So there are 12 pairs, okay, of nerves. They serve mostly the head and neck. There's one out of the 12 that actually goes down below the neck and serves the um, um, organs of the abdominal cavity, and that is called the vagus nerve, okay? It is the one that extends below uh, the neck and goes down into the thoracic and abdominal cavities. It's the only one that does not serve the head and neck. It actually serves abdominal um, organs like the stomach and the small intestine and so forth. And that's called your vagus nerve. Okay. Here are the 12. Okay. So you can see 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. They are numbered um, using um, Roman numerals. And let me find my pen. They are numbered using Roman numerals, okay? Your olfactory nerve is number, cranial nerve number one. Your optic nerve is cranial nerve number two. Your oculomotor is cranial nerve number three. Your trochlear nerve, and these are Roman numerals. Hopefully you remember Roman numerals. Your trochlear nerve is number four. Trigeminal is number five. Trigeminal is a really large uh, cranial nerve. The abducens is number six. Your facial nerve, it governs all your facial sensation, is number seven. Your vestibular cochlear is for balance and hearing. It's the one that goes to your ear. That's number eight. Your glossopharyngeal governs your uh, tongue. Okay, so this is number nine, and number nine is written like this. Your vagus nerve is number ten. Uh, ten is an X in Roman numerals. Your accessory 
is number 11. Your accessory um, controls your trapezius and your sternocleidoid mastoid muscles. Okay, that's what your accessory nerve does. And then hypoglossial, whenever you see glossial, think of tongue because the hypoglossial also controls the tongue. And that's number 12. Okay, so these are the uh, 12 um, cranial nerves. So olfactory, olfactory is like smell, optic is sight, ocular motor has to do with your eyes, trochlear has to do with your eyes, trigeminal does with sensations of the face, okay, um, abducens also does with eyes, facial also does um, sensory and motor functions of the face, vestibular cochlear is um, your ears, so this is going to be balance and hearing is your vestibular cochlear. Glossopharyngeal and hy uh, hypoglossial both have um, sensations in the tongue, so tasting, okay, and tongue movements. Vagus is the one that goes down to the digestive organs, okay, um, and it controls digestive organs. Whenever you feel, um, you might, like, if you've ever given blood, this, and uh, if you've ever given blood, and you feel really lightheaded, and you feel like you're passing out, that's called the vagal response, and you can thank your vagus nerve for that. Okay, and then accessory, like I said, governs the trapezius and the sternocleidomastoid. Okay, so these are all of the um, the twelve cranial nerves. Most of them, you know, all of them act above the neck. Here's what I like this picture. You can kind of see all of them here. Okay, so olfactory is smell. So um, you know, this first these bulbs here, bulb-like structures. Those are your olfactory uh, bulbs, and they detect. They sit in the ethmoid bone. And they sit right here at the top of your nasal cavity, and they detect smell. Okay, and it goes um, in through the olfactory. Okay, and it's going to go to the temporal bone that does smell. Okay, your optic nerve is number two. Okay, and here's remember the optic chiasm. This is where it crosses. Okay, here's the little mammillary bodies right there. Okay, but these this is the optic nerve. This is number two. This helps you to be able to see. Okay, um, the ocular motor, the trochlear, and the abducens. All three of these muscles, or so all three of these nerves govern muscles of the eye. Um, there are actually six muscles that surround the eye that allow eye movements. And um, so these muscles control those six um, muscles that surround the eye. Okay, You have like a superior rectus, an inferior rectus, a lateral rectus, a medial rectus. You have a superior oblique and you have an inferior oblique. And so those six muscles are governed by these three cranial nerves. Okay, um, Then you have trigeminal, which gives, you can see, it gives sensation to these areas of the face. It's a very large nerve. If you can see it on here, um, it's this nerve right here. It's one of the larger. It's on either side, the trigeminal. Okay, um, But you can see it controls the sensations of these areas in the face. Okay, um, Then here's uh, also the trigeminal, also controls the masseter, the muscles of chewing. So there's also trigeminal there. There's three branches of the trigeminal nerve hence try. Um, so you have a sensory branch that can cover sensation of the face. Um, and then you have the, um, um, also it controls the muscles of mastication. So here you can see your masseter. And then there's a third branch, but I don't know if they have it on here. Uh, they only, it looks like they only have two. Um, I don't know. We'll have to, may, there might be another picture on, on one of them. Okay. Um, here's facial nerve. It governs muscles of facial movement. Okay. It also has sensory function where it controls your tear ducts. Uh, it controls your um, salivary glands. That's also facial. Okay. Um, it controls sensation in your tongue. Okay. So that's also going to be facial. Okay. Um, here's vestibular cochlear. This is what's found in your ear. Okay. So that you've got your vestibule, um, which controls your um, balance, okay, and then you have your cochlea, cochlea, which controls hearing, okay, so that's your vestibular cochlear nerve, um, that's number eight, okay, then you have glossopharyngeal, and uh, you also have hy uh, hypoglossial, both of these uh, do tongue movements and tongue sensations, okay, so, um, you know, taste bud sensation, and then also being able to move your tongue and your pharynx, okay, you can kind of see that there. Um, vagus goes down into um, lungs, all your digestive organs. It's the only one that leaves and goes past the neck. Okay, so that's your vagus. That's number 10. And then your accessory, number 11, controls, like I said, the sternocleidomastoid and the trapezius. So these are all of your cranial nerves. There's 12 of them, okay? And if you can remember the mnemonic, ooh, 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 to touch and feel very good velvet at home. Or I always say, ooh, 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 to touch and feel very good velvet, ah, like A-H-A. -H 
Okay, and that's the way you can kind of remember the order 1 through 12. All right, you do need to know the order, and you do need to know the functions of, I want, you don't have to know the functions of all of them, but I do want you to know the functions of olfactory, optic. Um, I want you to know the um, function of vestibular cochlear. Um, I want you to know the function of vagus and accessory. So those are the ones I really want you to learn the functions of. Okay, um, what's really interesting about um, the cranial nerves in terms of your eyes. So there are 12 cranial nerves, right? Okay. Out of those 12, how many govern the eyeball? Okay. Well, optic helps you to see. Ocular motor, trochlear, um, abducens, okay, all play a role in uh, helping you see. Okay. So out of the 12, four of them control the eye. Okay. So optic, ocular motor, trochlear, and abducens. So four of the 12 just control eye, the eye. Okay. So the eye is a really important sensory organ um, in terms of taking information in from our environment. Okay. And so sometimes my daughter was playing the, that game, um, I forget what it's called, which, which would you rather, something like that. And one of them said, would you rather lose your sight or would you rather lose your hearing? Um, and I definitely would be hearing because um, so much of what we gain from our environment is what we see. Okay. And like I said, we can see that um, there's only one um, cranial nerve for hearing, but there are four that are related to the eye, okay, four of the 12. So I think I would definitely rather lose my hearing than, than lose my sight, okay. Um, but so these are the cranial nerves and they govern really specific things and I'm sure there'll probably be some homework questions on it, okay. Um, but here's a really nice summary of what they all do, okay. Um, so, you know, again, olfactory is, um, you know, smell, optic is being able to see, Okay, ocular motor is governing um, motions of the eyeball, being able to move your eye. It also allows your eyelid to close and open. It also regulates pupil size. So ocular motor does a lot of different things in your eye. Okay, trochlear also uh, plays a role in um, muscles that surround the eye. Okay, trigeminal conducts sensory impulses from the skin of the face, mucosa, nose, mouth. Okay, um, and it activates the muscles of chewing, okay, like the masseter. Your abducens controls eye movements, okay, so there's another eye muscle that's called your abducens, it's number six, okay. Facial, this activates muscles of facial expression. It also controls your tear, the lacrimal glands that, that uh, make you cry, Sal salivary glands that secrete saliva, okay. Um, so those are all, also it um, plays a role in taste bud sensations with taste sensation, okay, and the anterior portion of the tongue, that, the front two-thirds of your tongue um, are controlled by, by the facial nerve in terms of being able to taste, okay. Um, vestibular cochlear, that is, would be see, um, uh, not seeing, uh, hearing imbalance, okay, that's number eight, that's one of the ones I want you to learn, okay. Glossopharyngeal supplies the uh, fibers of the pharynx, okay, promotes swallowing and sal saliva production, um, also plays a role in um, being able to taste, so taste bud sensation, okay. Uh, vagus, this is the one that goes down to the heart, lungs, uh, stomach, small intestine, large intestine. They regulate uh, activities of the heart, digestive system, and so forth. That's the vagus, okay. It's number 10. And then the last two are your accessory and your hypoglossial accessory, again, your sternocleidomastoid and your trapezius that helps to activate those muscles. Your last one is your hypoglossial. Um, these play a role in um, sensory functions of the tongue, so taste buds, being able to taste things, okay? All right, also it has some control of tongue movements. All right, so those are the 12 cranial nerves and kind of what they do, okay? All right, that ends part F.